Genesis 50, verses 22 to 26, we're shown the character of Joseph. And he is marked by an incredible sense of forgiveness, despite what's happened to him. He presents this forgiving spirit. He also seems to have a strong sense of identity about who he is. He has not become Egyptian. He's not been wowed by um, all the palace life. He is still very much himself. And he's a humble guy. This humility is a really interesting thing. You can't kind of make yourself humble, can you? I'm not talking about the humility like of uh, sort of Uriah Heep being all kind of creepy and yes master, you know, a sort of pretend servility. I'm talking about being at peace with yourself and not having to strive to show yourself better than other people around you. You could be really poor and still proud and arrogant within your own circle. You could be a, a little Hitler in your own house and vice versa. You could live surrounded by praise and flattery, like Joseph did, and yet still be calm. And when things come your way, it just, you leave it dead. It, it just falls flat. Now, I have to confess here, once somebody asked for my autograph. Isn't that cool? Yeah, but I didn't let it go to my head. Right, I think it was an accident, actually. <laughs> They're waiting for the guy that came uh, behind me. But anyway, leaving that aside, to think of flattery coming your way and there's no flutter, little butterfly of vanity coming up inside you. Oh, really? I'll sign here. Do you get the picture? It doesn't depend on what you have. It depends on who you are inside. And you see it in Joseph. Even in his dream coat days, he's... Um, he wasn't really lauding it over his brothers when he recounted this dream of his success. Because if he had been, he wouldn't have said so much, would he? I don't think so. I don't think so. So he had this identity of who he was, this humility and a kind of simplicity running together. Can you do it? Can you live rich and stay humble? Because that's real greatness, I think. It's that simple inner life which is indifferent to fame. And celebrity. It's what Jesus demonstrated. It's the life of the cross. The cross was born by the King of Kings who had the opportunity for power, the opportunity for all adulation, and yet he chose the way of degradation instead. And there's another thing too in Joseph's life. It's a kind of kindness. I think kindness is so underrated. There's a real sense of benevolence, a lovely, gracious do-goodery that comes out of Joseph's life. Think of it, he used his wisdom and his forethought, he used his prophetic insight to, to save a country from a famine. And he, he thought it through and worked it out and then followed the plan and, and provided a, a national safety net for everyone. And also he increased the power of the monarchy, didn't he? Because all the land came into the power of the Pharaoh. And so Joseph's death was like his life. When Jacob died, they had 70 days of national mourning just because he was Joseph's father. So what did they have for Joseph? It doesn't tell us, but I would assume it's at least the same. And the homage was paid not to his wealth, not to his birth, but to his character. Do you like that? Isn't that wonderful? Joseph was a foreign slave, risen to eminence by what he did and by the way he did it. And there was a general mourning for, for the one who was literally, quite literally, the saviour of Egypt. And one more thing. They embalmed his body. That was the Egyptian custom. That's what they did with royalty. That's what they did with really, really important people. And the idea of embalming as far as the Egyptians were concerned, hints at a belief in resurrection. Did you know that? They believed that if you get the body as much as it is <laughs> when it's alive, that because they, they thought immortality was associated with a form. But Joseph had another thing on his mind. He commanded his fellow Israelites to, to take his bones with them when they left the land and went back to the dream of the promised land. Okay. He 
he was looking for something else. Because you see, Christianity doesn't disappoint the feeling that the Egyptians were reaching forward. It meets the feeling. Resurrection of the body, sown in the perishable, raised in imperishable. I believe this. I believe you will never be so much yourself as when you're raised from the dead. I believe it. The resurrection of the body is the Christian doctrine which fills the notions of the Egyptians and the process of embalming, embalming and even the reverence that the Hebrews felt for the bones of, of uh, Joseph. So, here's the last thing. Here's the last part of Joseph's character. The real thing that puts him into the Bible. It was his faith. His faith in the future. Take my bones with you. I am only part of the promise of God. He was reaching forward for what God was doing. A faith for a return from the land. In Hebrews 11, it talks about Joseph's faith. It says this, By faith, Joseph gave commandment concerning his bones. How did he know that his people would ever leave Egypt? They were settled there. He was bringing them in. They were settling down in a new society where he knew by faith. He looked forward. And that's the evidence of the resurrection. We look forward to what we do not see by faith and we face a common end. Sooner or later somebody will write your obituary. Okay, but the only one in whom who can believe in immortality is the one in whom the resurrection has already begun. Do you hear it? When Christ comes alive in your heart Eternal life is knowing Jesus. The one who believes in the future is the one who lives in it in the present. God bless you today. Amen.